Hey colleagues, if you are a mental health professional but feel like you don't have an understanding of the basic medicines that are used to treat common mental illnesses, then listen up because in this series we're diving deep into psychopharmacology for therapists. Welcome to Psychopharmacology for Therapists. In this series, we're going to take on common mental illnesses and the common medications that are prescribed to treat these mental illnesses from the perspective of therapists. We're not going to go into the nitty gritty of every single detail about molecules and chemistry because therapists don't need to know that stuff. Just an overview of the basics with me, a real life therapist, also giving commentary on how I've seen these medicines used in the field and in my own practice. Now you might be thinking, Jim, why do I need to know anything about medicines? I'm a therapist, I do talk therapy. I'm not prescribing medicines. But it is really important that you and I have a basic understanding of this very important tool for mental health. First off, medicine is an important supplement to therapy. Now, while we all generally know that therapy is one of the most effective interventions a patient can ever receive, we also know that their primary intervention is usually going to be some kind of medicine that they got from their primary doctor. And that's important to keep in mind because most of your patients are going to be on medicine already by the time they get to you. So you should have a basic understanding of what those medicines do and what they're for. Another important reason is that whenever your patient tells you about medicines they've taken in the past, those are important clues to symptoms and experiences they've had in the past. If they casually mention a mood stabilizer or an antipsychotic, it's important that you know what those medicines did when they took them because that teaches you valuable lessons about your patient's history. Lastly, some of the major roles that we as therapists can provide when it comes to medicine is education, referral, and monitoring. And that's an important function that we have as therapists, and that can only be done if we have a basic understanding of medicine itself. So let's talk about these three big functions that we as therapists should be doing when it comes to our relationship to medicine and the patient's relationship to medicine with us. Number one, we're here to educate. You need to have a firm understanding of psychiatric medication because you need to be able to give your patient accurate information about these medicines. That doesn't mean that you're the one offering them the medicines or telling them what to take, but you may be that first person in their relationship with medication that can teach them about what medicines are effective, what medicines are common, and demystifying some of what medicines actually do. Another important function you have as a therapist is being the one to refer them, to tell the patient, I think you would benefit from medicine and I want you to go see your primary doctor or a psychiatrist in order to get those medicines. And giving your patient the information of here's how to ask for that, here's how to talk about that. You can tell the doctor, my therapist suggested I talk to you about these medicines. So that referral source and what we call a warm hand off is an important function of what we do as therapists. And lastly, another important function we have is to monitor. That means that we're keeping track of patients that are on medicines. We're noticing things like symptoms, improvement, difficulties, side effects, and we're helping them maintain compliance with those medicines, coaching them, normalizing some of their experiences, and also knowing what to look for if some of those experiences are not good. It's important to keep in mind that those three primary functions are actually almost the only functions that therapists should have when it comes to our relationship with medicine. You as a therapist are not a prescriber. It is way outside of your scope. You can inform people, you can make recommendations that they consult with another professional, and you can assist as part of the medical team monitoring those patients. But you do never prescribe medications. You never suggest medications and tell them, I want you on this specific medicine. I've read about it. It's really good. You should take it. Um, no, you can send them to a physician or a psychiatrist. You can educate them about 
options and then encourage them to talk about that with the prescriber. So we do not prescribe medications. We also do not direct the use of medications. We don't tell the patient how to take their medicines, when to take their medicines, or come up with creative suggestions like why don't you take a double dose or why don't you cut that one in half. That is outside of our scope. We provide support, education, referral, consultation, and monitoring. We do not tell them how to take their meds or specifically which meds to take. We also don't tell them not to take their meds. If they've been prescribed medicines, we refer them back to their physician, back to their prescriber, and say, why don't you consult with them about what you're going through? Let me help you language that so that you know what to say to that doctor and, and to report your truth. But we do not tell them, hey, I want you to stop taking that sertraline and start taking this other thing or start taking these uh, supplements or cut that one in half. This is well beyond the scope of what we do. And so we never do that. We only educate, refer, and monitor. Speaking of things we shouldn't do, another important one is casting doubt on the prescriber. Yes, there's going to be times where we really think a doctor is making the wrong decisions. We're going to think that that psychiatrist or that primary has a fundamentally misunderstood view of the patient and what their symptoms are. But we have to be very, very careful because if we start casting aspersions on the prescriber, casting doubt on their medical choices, A, we're operating outside of our scope because we are not part of that prescribing chain and we should not be offering some kind of second opinion on that. We can refer, again, one of our primary functions to another doctor or ask the patient to consider another clinician in the same uh, psychiatry clinic and get a second opinion. We can offer information and write some kind of case summary and get permission to send that to the medical clinic to say, hey, here are the symptoms that I've charted. Here's what I've noticed. Um, it's important that you, doctor, have all that information so that you can make the best, most informed uh, decision possible. But we do not uh, cast doubt. We do not tell the patient, your doctor's bad, they're making bad choices, um, or cast doubt on the medicines that are being prescribed. And a good reason for that is the same reason that the airline industry uh, never advertises safety as one of their key ingredients for their brand. You don't see Delta saying, we are a safer airline than Frontier. Uh, you don't see Frontier saying, we are a safer airline than Spirit. And the reason for that is because the entire industry knows that it benefits nobody for any person to have any fear for the safety of airlines. All airlines would suffer equally and do suffer equally anytime there is a crash. In the same way, mental health care needs to have that same mindset. It's hard to address mental health care needs. It's hard for patients to seek medication. It's hard for them to get help. When we cast doubt and we criticize other prescribers or other providers, what we're doing is taking away the credibility and safety of the entire mental health field. That doesn't mean that we have to support every decision everybody makes. Certainly, we can lobby for correction. We can do this professionally. But it's very important that we as therapists know that our role is not here to second-guess the prescriber or criticize those medical choices. Yet another thing that therapists should not do is try to play armchair pharmacist and say, okay, I won't try to prescribe any medicines because obviously no pharmacy would fill them, but I will tell you that you should take some kind of natural supplement or you should go uh, take some kind of special substance or eat this kind of diet and increase or decrease this or that. Look, again, those are things outside of our scope. There are other providers who are nutritionists and dietitians and physicians who should be making choices about metabolics and chemistry and nutrition in these patients. When we start telling them which over-the-counter medicines to take or which supplements to take or how to eat or live differently, we're stepping well beyond what we're here to do as functional mental health providers. We can refer them to other professionals. We can educate them and insist that they think about those things and make their own choices but we have to remember it is outside of our scope we are here to educate refer and monitor lastly another important no-no is to remember and i can't believe i have to actually tell people this you cannot suggest or give your patient narcotics even if you feel like uh, psilocybin mushrooms marijuana or any other exciting narcotic is on the cutting edge of science and you're really really passionate about that new exploration 
It is a federal crime and so far beyond your scope of practice to ever provide these people with any kind of me medicine, supplements, and especially a narcotic. Um, that is drug trafficking. You will not get a pass just because you were trying your best to help people or because you can print some PDF that says that there's been some encouraging research. Medicine is prescribed by a physician and dispensed by a pharmacy, not bought on the black market or the shady side of the internet and brought to the patient in your office no matter how you try to envelope that inside of you're just making your own choices or I'm just connecting you to outsiders I have nothing to do with it you're facilitating drug trade it is a federal crime and it is not what we are here to do we as therapists only educate refer and monitor so now that we've talked about what you should and shouldn't do with all this information let's have a roadmap of what we're going to talk about in this presentation. The four big areas of medication that I think every therapist should be somewhat familiar with are as follows. Antidepressants, anxiolytics, which are basically what we use to treat anxiety, bipolar medicines, sometimes called mood stabilizers, and antipsychotics. Now these medicines can treat different things. It's not like only antidepressants can be used to treat depression or only antipsychotics can be used to te uh, treat delusions or, or psychotic symptoms. These things have a lot of crossover, but generally speaking, they do fall into those four buckets and they are used to treat those four particular mental illness packages. So let's start off by talking about antidepressants. And in this portion, we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of antidepressants with some of the older ones that aren't used as much anymore, all the way to the modern ones that are prescribed for nearly everything. And we're also gonna talk about some of the treatments used whenever we have treatment resistant depression, where it's not responding to typical medications in any dose. Before we dive into the medications, we should probably pause for a second to check in and make sure that you are aware that there are different types of major depressive disorder. And these different types may require different medicines or different dosages because of the severity or some of the symptoms that go along with those. So just to recap, when we're talking about major depressive disorder, we have single episode and we also have recurring episodes. In those episodes, we can have three different types of severity mild, moderate, or severe. And we can also describe the depression in partial or full remission. And even whenever somebody's depression is in remission of one type or another, that doesn't mean that they may discontinue their medicines. They may maintain those medicines in order to maintain some form of remission. It's also important to note that among these diagnoses for major depressive disorder, we can have specifiers like psychotic features, anxious distress, mixed features, and melancholic features. Again, all of these things can be factors in the medicines that are prescribed. So let's get started with the first antidepressants, monamine oxidase inhibitors, or what I like to call MAUIs. I'm pretty sure nobody else on earth calls them Mauis, but I do, and nobody has stopped me yet. So you have permission to do that until somebody criticizes you, at which time you should stop and pretend I never told you to do this and definitely don't throw me under the bus and tell anybody that I told you to say this. Anyway, these were discovered by accident in the 1950s from a tuberculosis drug that physicians discovered was improving people's mood and, and helping with some of the stubborn features of depression that often go along with chronic illness. They synthesized the medicine and discovered that it was inhibiting a particular compound called monamine oxidase. And so they realized, hey, maybe if we can continue to block monamine oxidase in the brain, that will help people's symptoms of depression. And it did, and it had worked for a while, and we still have them today. But today, they're not used very commonly, and that's because they do have really dangerous side effects um, that can affect your cardiovascular system. And these are so sensitive that people actually have to be really careful what they eat and drink um, because some of those dietary things can provoke these side effects and put them in real danger. Now, as we go through this presentation, we're going to practice saying all these pharmacy words because we want to be competent therapists. Now look, I'm not some etymologist here. I don't know exactly how to pronounce every single word ever. I have a little bit more uh, experience saying these words and I tend to get lucky when I sound them out. But I want you to practice saying them because I want you to be seen as a competent professional who's familiar with these words and familiar with these medicines and it comes through in the way you discuss them. So let's practice together. The first common Maui is called 
phenylzine, and its brand name is Nardil. When you see things in parentheses, um, basically I'm just showing you that that's how it's marketed to the public. That's the name it's sold under. But the word that's not in parentheses is basically the way it's referred to in chemistry. The second very common Maui is called, and let's try it together, tranylcypramine, also called parnate. Now, I also should point out that there have been some adjustments, and there's now a different type of Maui offered, which are referred to as MAOBs. And this one in particular is called Selagiline. I think I nailed that. And it's marketed under Depranil and Ensam. So now let's talk about the next generation of antidepressants, tricyclic antidepressants. So these two were sort of discovered by accident. They were adapted from an antipsychotic called imipramine in the early 1960s. Now these were important as a discovery because they are quite a bit safer than those Mauis we talked about a moment ago, but they do still have some powerful side effects and one of their downsides is they can be lethal if you overdose on them. Now tricyclics or TCAs are still used today. They are relatively common. Um, they're not usually the first choice, but they are a medicine that will be reached for by some physicians given certain situations. Let's practice saying all these fun words. Amitriptyline, clomipramine, desipramine, doxepin. By the way, I do see doxepin prescribed quite a bit. Imipramine, that was that original one from the 1960s. Oh, this one's fun. Nortitriptyline and trazodone. Trazodone is another one as a therapist that I see prescribed quite a bit, usually used as some kind of sedative, especially for nightmares. All right, now we're going to talk about the new kid on the block, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs. Now, this is going to be the most common medicine that you're going to see your patients have, and it's a very good medicine overall. Not only is it new, but it doesn't have those dangerous side effects that tricyclics have or Maui's have, and it is less dangerous to overdose on, which makes it important because obviously depressed patients could potentially have a risk factor in that department. Now, it's considered a cleaner medicine, and what that means is that it kind of just does its job, whereas tricyclics sort of scattershot um, their medicine all over the place and can affect a number of other areas of your brain. SSRIs are very, very specific. And so for that reason, we consider them clean. They just kind of do their job. They do still have uh, side effects and they can have a range of side effects. Sexual dysfunction is one of the ones that your patients might complain about most. They might notice that they have a loss of libido or difficulty in ejaculation. Now, I want to take a beat to explain to you how I teach patients how SSRIs work. Because again, one of our primary functions as therapists is to educate the patient. The way that I like to explain it is I tell them that we have these little dripping water faucets in our brain, and they drip these things called neurotransmitters, the juices that flow through our brain. One of those neurotransmitters is called serotonin. And what this medicine does is it inhibits the reuptake of the serotonin. So it basically clogs the drain at the bottom of the sink so that whenever we drip the serotonin, it builds up and builds up and builds up. So our brain gets more of its own juice. And that's what's special about SSRIs. They're not adding something to your brain. They're just allowing your brain to marinate in its own serotonin for longer before it drains away. And this is also such a gentle medicine that it takes a while to work. This is part of my pitch, how I explain it to patients, is that it almost is taking little pieces of paper and tossing them in the sink one by one and allowing that to slowly clog the drain. So it can take two to four weeks for that drain to clog sufficiently before you really start to notice a result. For this reason, though, it's a very gentle medicine. It's very reliable. We have decades of research telling us that they're very effective, very few side effects, very few long-term side effects. And of course, if you dig deep enough on the internet, you'll find somebody who had a bad experience and has a story to tell. But by and large, you can trust these medicines and they're very effective. Many of us call them the Tylenol of mental health because they are so common and considered to be pretty darn safe. So that's my pitch, and you're welcome to borrow that kind of language. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the medicines that you're going to see. So here we go. We're going to try to pronounce these things. And all of these, by the way, are very common to see in the field. So fluoxetine, also called Prozac, citalopram, 
Celexa, Escitalopram, Lexapro, Fluvoxamine, feel like I nailed that, Luvox, I don't see that one very often, Paroxetine, which is Paxil, and Sertraline, which is Zoloft. Of the ones I just named, I tend to see Zoloft, Prozac, and Lexapro the most, um, Celexa second, Paroxetine sometimes, and rarely, if ever, uh, Luvox. So those SSRIs we talked about, we've actually developed into another area that kind of combines two different types of neurotransmitter reuptake inhibition. In this case, serotonin and also norepinephrine, just another neurotransmitter. So these are working the same way, right? They're still clogging the drain. They're just clogging two different drains at the same time. And they're really similar to SSRIs when it comes to side effects, though sometimes they can be a little bit worse. Again, not dangerous, just uncomfortable. Now, SNRIs are not typically prescribed right away. Um, they're usually used secondarily after SSRIs have been ineffective um, or if we have more severe cases because we want to throw a little bit more at them. So let's practice saying some of the common names of these medicines. Again, all of these um, I have seen in the field, um, and some of them a little bit more often than others. So venlafaxine, also called Effexor, that one's really common. Desvenlafaxine, also called Pristique, again, pretty common. Duloxetine, called Cymbalta, very common. Luvomilnasopran, also called Fetzema, I rarely see that one. And Mirtazapine, also called Remeron. Slightly more common, um, but not as common as Effexor and Cymbalta and Pristique. So we've talked about serotonin reuptake inhibitors. We've talked about serotonin and norep norepinephrine <laughs> reuptake inhibitors. Um, and you're probably wondering, how come they have to be combined? Well, they don't. Um, there is just norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, or NRIs. And again, using that metaphor, um, they clog the norepinephrine sink. So just one of the neurotransmitters. Now, these do have different effects in the body, and usually they are used as an ADHD medication but they can be used off-label for depression. These have a little bit of a different response in the body. They tend to improve people's energy, their ability to focus, but they also can kind of be triggering. They can cause anxiety. You might see that loss of appetite, sexual dysfunction, or paradoxically, sedation. So let's practice saying the one that's in America, atomoxetine or stratera, and there's also one commonly used in Europe but not yet approved in America, uh, riboxetine or vestra. You will usually see stratera, but again, it's not terribly common because usually people are going to use those SSRIs or SNRIs, and rarely are we going to end up using stratera. So as science has progressed, we now have new classes of medicines that don't quite fit into any box, and we refer to these as atypical antidepressants. So one of the most common ones is what's called bupropion, or Wellbutrin is how it's marketed. Now this one's different. It doesn't function the same way with clogging that whole sink situation. Instead of clogging something or inhibiting something, it's increasing a different kind of thing in the body, a word that I always struggle with, but we're going to try it anyway. It's noradrenergic activity and dopaminergic activity. So what energic means is that it is somehow affecting the, whatever you saw at the beginning of that word. So dopaminergic means that it's affecting dopamine. And anytime you're increasing dopamine, you're usually creating stimulation. So bupropion has that effect. So it can also have those common effects of stimulants like anxiety and insomnia, but it is not a stimulant just to be clear clear. And it does also augment SSRIs, which is kind of neat because it can actually neutralize their side effects. So sometimes what you'll see is somebody that's been taking SSRIs for a while and they're not having the effects that we want. And the physician says, I don't want to keep just increasing your dose. Let's go ahead and partner that medicine up with Wellbutrin and let's see if that can boost the effect. And it often does, which is a really great tool. And another medicine that we see in this atypical category is what's called Buspirin or Buspar, and this is neat because it's an anti-anxiety medicine, but it can be used, like Wellbutrin is, to augment the power of those SSRIs. More atypical antidepressants to mention is Velazidone or Vibrid. Now, Vibrid's different because it is an SSRI, but it also has a different mechanism, which is called a 5-HT1A receptor partial 
agonist. And what does that do? Well, it's a particular receptor in your neurons that are responsible for neuromodulation. Again, I promised you we're not getting into the chemistry because we're not here to get a degree in that. We're here to have basic understandings of these things. But what you need to know is that it can be used to co-treat anxiety. And so it can be pretty effective, but it is a version of an SSRI. So it's also used as an antidepressant. Another one that you'll see is Trintelix or Vorchiozetine. I think I nailed that. This is also an SSRI, but again, it's not just an SSRI, it's a hybrid. And this one's also dopaminergic, which again, has to do with the effects of dopamine in the system. So it's kind of combining, uh, not necessarily inhibiting dopamine, uh, but combining the stifling of serotonin with the increase of dopamine. And, and that can have really great effects. It can stimulate against low energy and apathy and be a really great supplement for depression. So let's talk about stimulants. Now look, I have some strong opinions about this because we live in an era where anybody who can get their hands on amphetamines seems to get their hands on amphetamines. And I don't know that that's great for mental health overall, and I don't love it as a primary treatment for depression. So usually you're gonna see doctors prescribe all the things we've talked about previous to this slide before they land on stimulants, unless somebody comes in and really tells the doc, this is what I want. But what do stimulants do? Well, most of you are aware that they increase energy, they have a general uh, ability to improve your affect, and you might feel a bit motivated. And so a lot of people seem to feel like they're getting more momentum in life when they're on them. And it is important to note that stimulants can do what we saw Buspar do and Wellbutrin do, which is augment other antidepressants. They do have side effects, and those need to be noted because a lot of people think that they're completely harmless. They are not. Um, they can cause anxiety, insomnia, agitation, appetite suppression, which a lot of your patients will say, good. Good. I've been gaining weight on depression anyway, so this will help me. Um, but it is important to recognize that they are addictive. They are a narcotic. And so they are habit forming and they can become easy to abuse because they also induce euphoria and that can cause people to become addicted to how good it feels. Um, so they're usually contraindicated for anybody that has any history of alcohol abuse or narcotic use. And that can be difficult because those same people are not exactly going to admit that um, when they really, really want this medicine. So here are two of the most common ones. You've got dextroamphetamine, also marketed as dexedrine, and methylphenidate, which is marketed as Ritalin. Now again, word of caution, um, don't recommend these. You are here to educate, refer, and monitor. Let people do their job. If your physician who's working alongside you or the psychiatrist is giving these medicines to a patient who you know has a tendency to abuse narcotics or alcohol or a history of addiction, you might want to ask for permission from the patient to collaborate with the physician so that you can make them aware of that. Because oftentimes these doctors are treated like vending machines. Patients just show up, push buttons, and get their candy. And we want to make sure that the patient's well taken care of. So sometimes medicines don't work and the patient's experiencing what we often refer to as treatment resistant depression. So when that happens, there are some options that people might use in those situations. One of them comes from like uh, sci-fi and horror fiction films, electroconvulsive therapy. Unfortunately, the media has made this out to be something terrifying because in its early discovery, it was something kind of terrifying. So it was discovered in the 1930s, and what we saw was that epileptic patients who were having seizures would sometimes have decreased symptoms of depression after their attack. So the idea came out, what if we just induce an electric shock into this person's brain and would that cause kind of a reboot and change their experience of depression? So it was used to induce a grand mal seizure. And that can be done, especially if we put the patient under with anesthesia to make sure they don't hurt themselves and we can keep them strapped down during the seizure. It can be done correctly and ethically. Today, believe it or not, ECT is considered the gold standard in effectiveness. Its side effects are actually quite rare, but it is still considered a treatment of last resort, obviously because we're inducing a seizure in your brain, and that's a pretty big step, but it is very effective. 
So another treatment resistant alternative is what's called transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS. And it's kind of been taking the world by storm. It's showing up in every neighborhood. It has a lot of promise to it. And a lot of people like it because they don't have to take any medicine. They can just kind of do this outpatient treatment really quickly and hopefully get some results. So how does it work? Well, basically you sit in a chair, you put on this magnetic hat and these magnetic coils send external pulses to areas of the brain associated with depression. So they're not doing what ECT does in that invasive sensor trying to trigger a seizure. They're very lightly pulsating from the outside, so there's no invasive procedure done, that's trying to just stimulate portions of the brain that we associate with depression. Usually treatments are really quick. They're 20 minute procedures. You do them just by driving over and stopping by, you're in and out, but you do have to do them daily for multiple weeks, sometimes up to a month. Now, here's a word of caution. Yes, TMS is scientifically validated. Yes, it can actually be used. But there's a lot of shadiness in the market right now. A lot of the providers are over-promising and under-delivering. They're making it a snake oil cure that can do everything. And the truth is it is quite expensive. Insurance doesn't always cover it. And a lot of these providers are kind of shady. And they just say, yep, you just got to keep doing it forever and ever, amen. When really, I think it's best used as a treatment-resistant alternative when the typical treatments of medicine and psychotherapy aren't getting us the results that we want to see. A couple of other treatment resistant alternatives to mention that are not used terribly commonly um, but do exist. The first one, vagus nerve stimulation. In this case, they actually implant a device into the chest of the patient and it has a wire which stimulates the vagus nerve system. So there's a lot of neat evidence coming out about vagus nerve stimulation that shows that it can be effective on depression, but obviously implanting a device in somebody's chest is kind of a last resort. Another one is a treatment called deep brain stimulation kind of the same thing except in this case they're going to surgically implant a device into the skull which stimulates portions of the brain with electric shock again these are considered kind of extreme they are not something that we do all the time they are very unusual and they usually only will be given to patients that are at high risk for suicide seem to have permanent severe depression and this becomes really the best option for them medically so as we wrap up this conversation about treatment resistant alternatives to depression, I want to talk a little bit about this little ditty, ketamine and its derivative S-ketamine. Now these have been really popular in the media because they are high power narcotics. They get you high, they give you euphoria, they help you dissociate from reality. And that's caused a lot of people to embrace them excitedly, believing that not only can curing depression be effective, but also lots of fun. And it's also led to a lot of dangerous deaths and a lot of bad outcomes with a lot of patients um, for many, many reasons, not the least of which is that when we overhype these things and underregulate them, we have people scoring them on the street or getting them wherever they can, taking them home, using them, and then dying from them because they are extremely powerful. Now, ketamine is usually delivered intravenously. It's an anesthetic. It's used to shut down pain and give you basically a euphoric high. And we do have research which shows that it can be effective for severe depression in the short term. Now, it's not necessarily more effective in the long term, but some people believe that it could be a really good tool <clears throat> for use in something like an emergency room if somebody was really near a suicidal action. Presently, as I record this, it is not FDA approved for use with depression. However, people use it off-label, and so a lot of doctors who can prescribe it, like veterinarians, have started prescribing it to humans for depression treatment when really it should be used for pain symptoms. Now, S-ketamine, a derivative, is delivered intranasally, so this is something that you'd snort, and it should be done, again, under medical monitoring, not something you take home. This one is FDA-approved for depression. However, these medicines are costly, they are inconvenient, and often, at least in my city, are delivered by really shady providers who have popped up all over the place and don't seem very well regulated or very familiar with mental health overall. Generally speaking, these medicines offer short-term benefits. They have serious side effects like confusion, disorientation, hallucinations, and unusual thoughts. And again, while they do have value for severe cases that are treatment resistant, they are not something people should be recommended generally. Since we're talking about narcotics and how excited people are to use them, we should probably point out that there are some things that are not medicines and overhyped in the marketplace and on the internet. One of them, of course, is cannabis, marijuana. Where I live in Las Vegas, 
Cannabis is completely legal. People use it recreationally, and a lot of states have adopted the use of it medicinally. And yes, there is some research that it can be effective for things like pain treatment and various other maladies, but it is not effective for chronic depression. And in fact, in my experience, usually makes patients worse overall as they do not develop coping skills and we don't see that the mechanism of action of marijuana is something sustainable. They usually just develop a habit to it and become actually worse off overall. Another one that a lot of people are overhyping are psychedelics, things like psilocybin and LSD. Yes, there is new research talking about how these medicines or these narcotics, these derivatives, can be used effectively for things like serious trauma. Um, but we do not see a lot of evidence, at least longitudinally at this point, that it should be used for depression. And again, unfortunately, a lot of people have heard the hype, heard popular voices talking about it, heard anecdotes about it, and they're going out there trying to get high on this stuff, believing that it will just evaporate their depression and they'll be better off and have some kind of epiphany. Lastly, another one that we hear about sometimes is MDMA or ecstasy. Again, these are all just street drugs. Ecstasy is a party drug. It gets you high. And a lot of people will say, wow, I took ecstasy and I didn't feel depression. Well, no joke. You take ecstasy, you don't feel anything at all. It's just a huge dump of dopamine and euphoria. But again, you're burning out receptors, and long term, it's not going to be something that delivers you from chronic depression. One of the big tests of any medicine that these three uh, individual medicines or substances fail is that a medicine should improve your functioning. Yes, it should attack your symptoms and improve uh, your suffering, but it also shouldn't subtract from your ability to function, like drive a car, parent your kids, or go to work. Obviously, all three of these substances subtract from your ability to function. They are overhyped, they are not medicines, and at this point, they do not have strong evidence bases to substantiate their use. As we get to the end of this conversation about antidepressants, I just want to remind you of a few things. People that are taking antidepressants are usually depressed, and one of the things that they're struggling with is patience and abilities to remain consistent. You need to keep in mind that most antidepressants take one to four weeks to start being effective, and so you're going to have to coach and support your patients so that they can maintain medical compliance until the medicines can reach that therapeutic dose. Depressed patients often struggle with doing the right thing and staying encouraged, so you're going to have to be that voice that's supporting them and carrying them over the finish line. And the last thing I want you to keep in mind is that people that are depressed often self-medicate. They abuse things like alcohol, marijuana, narcotics, and other medicines that can complicate the work that the medicine they're supposed to be taking is doing. You'll have a lot of patients that'll say, I don't know why these antidepressants aren't working. I've been taking them for two months, and I'm also smoking marijuana eight times a day or I'm drinking a six-pack every hour. When you hear about these complicating circumstances of narcotics or other psychostimulants, you have to help educate them that those things are counteracting the medicines they're meant to take and maybe nullifying the results. Next, we're going to talk about anxiolytics, or medicines designed to help people reduce anxiety. Now, these have lots of different types to them, and one of the interesting things you'll notice about patients who have anxiety is that they are hungry for some kind of treatment, whereas depressed patients may struggle with accepting the reality of depression and accepting that it's a problem that they can medicate. Uh, anxiety people are usually all too happy to get any kind of relief they can because the suffering of anxiety is so profound. Now, just like with depression, as we prepare to talk about anxiety, we should probably talk about the differences that anxiety can have, because there's different types of anxiety and different levels of severity. For example, do you know the difference between generalized anxiety disorder and what we call panic disorder, and perhaps the difference between both of those and what we might refer to as a panic attack? So referring back to the DSM, generalized anxiety disorder is going to have excessive worry and three symptoms like restlessness, feeling heat up or on the edge, being easily fatigued, difficulty concentrating or their mind going blank, irritability, muscle tension, or sleep disturbance. So, okay, we can sense that they're anxious and it's disruptive to their life for sure, but that's different than what we might call panic disorder. And the DSM defines that as recurrent, unexpected, abrupt surges of intense fear involving at least four of the following, palpitations, pounding heart, accelerated heart rate, sweating, trembling and shaking, sensations of shortness of breath or smothering, feelings of choking, chest pain or discomfort, nausea or abdominal distress, feeling dizzy, unsteady, lightheaded or faint, chills and heat sensations, 
per, uh, parenthesis, which is numbness or tingling sensations, derealization, feelings of unreality that they're detached from what's real, or depersonalization, being detached from themselves, and feeling fear or losing control, like they're going crazy or feeling fear of dying. So clearly, you can understand that there are different levels of severity between those two experiences. Panic disorder is very physical. It's very abrupt. It just sweeps in, and they it's, they can't think their way out of it. Whereas anxiety disorder is something where there's excessive worry, poor thinking, catastrophizing, cognitive distortions. You can learn to think your way out of it. These details are very important when we think about the kinds of medicines we use to treat both of these realities. So let's talk about that first line of defense, benzodiazepines. Now, benzodiazepines are really good for acute panic episodes. Yes, you can use them for panic disorder. Yes, you can use them for anxiety generally and anxiety attacks more specifically. As a general rule, physicians try not to give people these medicines indefinitely because there is some research that shows it can cause long-term memory issues. Now, if somebody's taking benzodiazepines, those benzos will affect them similarly to how alcohol mo molecules do. So it's a medicine that's contraindicated for people that have a history of drug or alcohol abuse because benzos are a narcotic. So let's play that fun game where we try to say all the words, and almost every single one of these is something you will see in your work. Um, patients will be prescribed any number of these. So we have classic old alprazolam called Xanax. We have chlordia. Ooh, let's try it again. Chlordiazepoxide. That feels right. Or Librium. I always hear it called Librium. And now I know why, uh, because that's a really big word that nobody wants to say. We have chlorazepate or transine. We have diazepam or valium. You'll hear that one a lot. Halazepam, paxapam, which I never see. Lorazepam or ativan. I see that one often. Oxazepam or serax. Never see that one. Prazepam or centrax. Also never see that one. Quazepam or Doral, never see that one, and Clonazepam or Clonopin, see that one regularly. Now under the category of benzodiazepines, we have some that are called atypical benzodiazepines. These are a little bit different because they're usually hypnotics or sedatives. They work really fast, they don't last as long, and they usually put you to sleep. So they're not typically prescribed whenever somebody's trying to function on that medicine the way some of these other medicines we just talked about are. Side effects are amnesia and even sleepwalking, which we see rarely but has totally happened. So ones that you'll find in this category, Estelzolam, or Prosom, I've seen people prescribed that. Zolpidem or Ambien, very, very common. Ezopisclone, which is Lunesta, yes, see that one a lot. And Zaloplon or Sonata, very common. Again, usually prescribed as a sleep aid for people that are having anxiety intrude on their ability to go to sleep. Now you remember this one from the portion of this presentation about antidepressants, Buspirone. Abuseperone is really cool because it doesn't work against the CNS, the central nervous system, which means that while no medicine is ever safe to take with alcohol, this one's a bit on the safer side if you know this person's going to continue drinking. It's also good because it's non-narcotic and non-habit forming, unlike benzos, which are very much both of those things. It has a delayed onset of action. It can take one to two weeks to take effect. Usually that means a medicine's much gentler, but usually also means that it will last longer and isn't just used for acute episodes, which is one of the things it doesn't do. It's not there to shut down your system very quickly and bring a sedation effect, so it doesn't work with that acute pain panic attack episode. And it does have some side effects like nausea, dizziness, and anxiety. Again, because anxiety and depression are very common, you find patients that do have both, and so it's not uncommon that people are given SSRIs to try to deal with their depression and hopefully assist with their anxiety, and then their uh, antidepressant may be boosted with buspirone to again assist with the anxiety and also augment the antidepressant effect. Next up is, in my opinion, one of the best medicines on the market, antihistamines. Now you might be thinking, Jim, antihistamines, those are allergy medicines. Yes, they are, but they're also used for dealing with anxiety. So what's great about these is they are completely non-narcotic. Yes, they are allergy medicines, but one of the known side effects of antihistamines is that sedation effect that you associate with things like Benadryl. And so it does have the effect of reducing anxiety. And they actually are really effective for acute panic and anxiety attacks. And you don't have to take a narcotic. And they last from four to six hours and they usually kick in in 15 to 30 minutes. 
Now, they do have some side effects. Yes, people know what it feels like to be drowsy on Benadryl, so that's a thing. Dry mouth, blurred vision can happen as well. Here are the names of those, and you've probably said them at some point in your life. Now, I pronounce the first one diphenhydramine. I've heard other people make a f sound, so diphenhydramine, but it's just Benadryl. And the most common one you'll see physicians prescribe is hydroxazine, or vis uh, oops, let's try it again, Vistaril or at Atorax. Now, quick note on Benadryl. Benadryl is an over-the-counter medicine. Your patient can just walk down to their local pharmacy and get one or their local Walmart and get a whole box of these things. They're very, very uh, gentle and they're not dangerous. But I still want you to stay in your lane and come back to that understanding that we're here to educate, refer, and monitor. So we don't like to tell patients, hey, you've got anxiety, I recommend going and taking Benadryl. And you might think, oh, I'm well within my rights, I'm not prescribing a medicine, I'm not telling them to go take marijuana or something else that's narcotic, it's just classical Benadryl. You can educate them that Benadryl has been used by some people as an over-the-counter solution, but you do not tell them, I want you to go do this, because now you're giving medicinal advice, which is outside of our scope of practice. Next, let's talk about beta blockers or antihypertensives. So these medicines, very common for anxiety relief, propranolol or indorol and atenolol or tenorumin. So these are heart meds. They block norepinephrine receptors. They are not habit forming. They also don't work acutely. Um, they're good overall. They can work within like the span of several hours, um, but I don't see that being something people should take when they're having a panic attack. Generally, they reduce peripheral anxiety symptoms. So like the sweating, rapid heartbeat, tremor, um, but not those internal symptoms. Like you're sitting there imagining that you're going to die or that you're gonna be fired. Those catastrophic thinking episodes or racing thoughts. Research does show that they're pretty good for performance anxiety because they have that stabilizing physical effect, um, but they don't necessarily, as we talked about, provide relief for those acute instances of actual panic or anxiety. Um, and then again, side effects, low blood pressure because it is a heart medication designed to decrease blood pressure because people that are taking them are taking it for hypertension relief, and they can slow you down so much that sometimes we see them actually cause depression. Now here's some more beta blockers uh, that you should be aware of. This next one is near and dear uh, to my heart and the heart of anybody who's ever worked at inpatient rehab, uh, clonidin or catapress or capve. So this is also a hypertensive medication, but it's also used to treat opioid withdrawal. And so when you've got all these people that are trying to get healthy off of drugs uh, and they're really sick and not doing well in your rehab, Boy, are you happy that this treats them, and it also calms them down, which is really, really helpful because nobody's happy at rehab. So a very effective medicine. It also is used to treat anxiety. Um, what does it do? The same thing. It inhibits that norepinephrine release, and it does have the side effect of sedation. Another one is prezosin or minipress. This is a high blood pressure medication. It has been used to treat nightmares. It does lower blood pressure, and it can cause that sedation. But with this one, there can be that risk of a dangerously low blood pressure. So that's something that a lot of physicians keep an eye on when they consider prescribing this. So a couple of things I want you to keep in mind when we talk about anxiety medicine and how to treat folks. First off, those benzodiazepines are usually the first thing that are offered besides SSRIs, which treat depression, but can also have a good anti-anxiety effect overall and over time. But benzos are addictive and they do have withdrawal symptoms when people take them too often and become dependent on them. They're really, really effective for that acute relief of panic. And so they are a legitimate medicine. But just as a therapist, you wanna be mindful of this, that it's not something that hopefully people are taking forever. Hopefully the therapy is working and they're starting to get some relief from their symptoms and they're not dependent on the benzos all the time. Another thing to keep in mind is that whenever you combine anxiolytics, those medicines that we just went over that have to do with treating anxiety and alcohol, that combination can often be lethal. The way I educate my patients is just reminding them these medicines that you're on, like benzos or antihistamines or any of these, especially uh, um, the heart medications, the beta blockers, boy, do they not like alcohol. They are not friends with alcohol. It will make you feel way worse and potentially in danger. And so I always try to warn people, these medicines do not mix, do not take them and then drink. So we are moving right along and we've reached the part of the presentation where we're gonna talk about bipolar medicines. Now, again, you should remember that the medicines we've talked about in the antidepressant chapter and also the anxiolytic chapter 
can show up in the treatment of bipolar, which we're going to discuss a little bit of, but bipolar is a very special mental illness, and so it does require its own special suite of medications. As we did with anxiety and depression, I want to take a second to just reflect together on the differences in the severity levels of bipolar disorder. Can you describe the differences between what we might call a manic episode or a hypomanic episode, which is very much part of how we define bipolar 1 or bipolar 2? So things to keep in mind is that both manic and hypomanic episodes have some of those same basic symptoms. They have inflated self-esteem and grandiosity, decreased need for sleep, like they're feeling fully rested after an hour or two. People can be more talkative than usual and have a pressure to sort of just keep talking. They have that flight of ideas or subjective experience. Their thoughts are racing. They're highly distractible and easily drawn to external stimuli. They also become more goal-oriented, more motivated. They're out there tackling all the world's problems. They become excessively involved in activities that have a high potential for painful consequences. So all of those things can coexist in both sides of this. But what you need to remember is that hypomanic, by definition, means submanic. So it's like diet mania. And the DSM points out that hypomanic episodes are not severe enough to cause marked impairment in social or occupational functioning or to necessitate hospitalization. But keep in mind, if there are ever psychotic features as part of the presentation of what your patient's going through, that is always, by definition, a manic episode. The first medicine we'll talk about is the classic medicine for bipolar disorder, lithium. Now what's neat about lithium is that it's just lithium. Like you go out to your high school uh, periodic table of elements that you remember learning about, and there's an element on there that just says lithium. <laughs> and that's what this is. It's not very complicated. It's just lithium. So anyway, it was first used in the 1970s, and in the beginning there was a lot of fear that it was causing cardiac side effects. Um, but today we do have a lot more data that shows us that it is overall safe, um, though of course, like all medicines, long-term use can have some side effects, but we're not worried about those cardiac events the way we used to be. So today it's considered a first-line treatment for bipolar disorder, and it has a very high success rate of almost 80% in some cases where it's treating that mania or depressive episode. However, lithium can be tricky to use and a lot of doctors want to uh, monitor it with blood work regularly because the therapeutic window is very narrow. That means the effective dose between what's going to work and what's going to kill you is a little too close for our preference. So it's something that doctors usually monitor with follow-up blood work and it can also take one to two weeks for full effect and it can take several months to find an actual balance where your patient's benefiting from it long term. The next category of medicines are anticonvulsants. Now that might catch your eye and you think, wait a minute, anticonvulsants, that's like a seizure medicine. Exactly, they are. They are anti-seizure medicines, but the FDA has approved them for the treatment of mania. So you'll see these out in the world with most of your patients. Yes, you're usually going to see uh, lithium as that first and primary uh, thing, but long term, we tend to see more of these. So one of them is Divalprox or Depakote. This is considered a first-line medicine for manic and mixed episodes. Another one is Carbamazip. Oh, I always mess this one up. Carbamazepine, carbamazepine, that feels right. I usually just call it Tegretol. Second line for manic, it's a first line for mixed. And lastly, Lamotrigine or Lamictal, which is a first line for bipolar depression and second line for rapid cycling. So again, a little bit of therapist commentary here. You are going to see patients with all three of these, not at the same time. Um, they tend to just be tried out and seeing what's going to stick to that patient and what's going to be helpful for them long term as the physician is measuring what their episodes are like. This is where you are very crucial as a monitor of what the patient's going through because you're tracking things like what kinds of episodes are they having, how long do they last, how quick is the cycling between them, how serious are the depression episodes, what kinds of behaviors are we noting that the patient is doing. And as you're tracking that information, hopefully that's feeding back to the physician or the psychiatrist who's prescribing so that we're making sure we're getting these patients the right medicine for what they're going through. So a moment ago, we talked about how anticonvulsants, seizure medicines, are used to treat bipolar, but also antipsychotics can be used as well. And in a little bit, we'll talk about different kinds of antipsychotics, but for now, you should know that second-generation antipsychotics can be pretty effective. They tend to be used as a primary treatment for acute and mixed mania. And let's try saying some of these names. 
eripiprazole, asenapine, caraprazine, olanzapine, catiapine, risperidone, and zipracidone. The ones that I tend to see most often prescribed are olanzapine, catiapine, and risperidone. Now you should also note that fluoxetine uh, can be combined with lurisidone, catiapine, or olanzapine to treat bipolar depression episodes. And lastly, that side effects can include seizures, cardiac arrhythmias, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, which is increased weight or type 2 diabetes, and hyperlipidemia, which is like uh, increased fat cells. So all of these realities can be important to note, but what you should know is antipsychotics can be very important, especially if somebody's dealing with manic episodes at that higher level. And this is also a very important medicine because it can interfere with that acute episode as it's happening. Now earlier we talked about how antidepressants and anxiolytics might still show up in the treatment of bipolar disorder, but you should actually know that they're somewhat controversial when prescribing SSRIs or things like that. Any antidepressant is a little bit difficult to bring into the treatment of bipolar. The reasons for that are that some studies show that there's a risk of triggering a manic or hypomanic switch. You certainly don't want a patient who's dealing with hypomania and depression switching over to mania. That would be terrible, and it can also increase their cycling. Now, when it is prescribed, we usually see that they are those classic selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or that atypical bupropion, which we talked about earlier. Some things I want you to keep in mind when you're treating your bipolar patients. First, you need to understand that they will miss their mania. That hypomania, that mania gives them incredible confidence. It feels like a superpower. It's addictive like a drug. It is a euphoric high where they are creative and powerful and confident. And that's something that when they don't have, they're not going to feel special. They're going to feel like they've lost a piece of themselves. So what I've noticed in my bipolar patients is that when we get them on medication long term, it can often be really difficult for them to understand that this is something they're going to be taking for a long time and or the rest of their lives. And it's also hard to take something that is actually holding them back from experiencing that natural high. And they used to rely on that high. It got a lot of things done for them. It's when they would be creative or get their jobs done or get a lot of output. But it also put them in danger. And it also had a cost of the depression that came with it. So keep that in mind. Educate, support your patients. Try to help them normalize the idea of taking their medication so that they can continue to be stable. All right, we're going to wrap up this talk of common medicines that therapists should know about with a discussion of antipsychotics. And just as before, I want to start with that conversation. Do you know what psychotic symptoms are? It's important that we do because these medicines, antipsychotics, are maybe the most powerful medicines we have in the psychopharmacology arsenal. And so it's important that, again, we're not prescribers, um, but we're monitoring for the symptoms that might be the things that trigger the use of these medicines. So let's review some of the things that we consider psychotic symptoms. First, we have delusions, which you remember is a wrong interpretation of the world around you. You're not necessarily hallucinating the girl that's talking to you, but you're convinced that she's in love with you and she's secretly trying to tell you that she wants you to marry her. That would be a delusion. Or the, the belief that the government is watching you and they're out to get you. There really is a government and the government really does have spy stuff and really does monitor something about people. But if you're taking it to an extreme place where it's making you paranoid and fearful of the world and you can't live, now it's a delusion. Another psychotic symptom is hallucinations, which most of us are very aware of. It's whenever you see things that aren't there, you hear things that are not there, those things are troubling and they're causing you to dysfunction in life. Another uh, psychotic symptom is disorganized speech, so frequent derailment or incoherent talk. Or another one is grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior, so that sense of just being out of the loop with reality, catatonic, flat affect, just shut down, and those negative symptoms like diminished emotional expression or avolition. So as we talk about antipsychotics, we're going to talk about them in two generations. The first generation antipsychotics, also called FGAs, were developed in the 1950s when a post-operational sedative, chlorpromazine, also called Thorazine, was discovered to have these antipsychotic properties. Now, Thorazine, by the way, is still prescribed. I've had patients who have had it. Um, but as we're going to talk about in a second, uh, the side effects can be pretty dang dangerous and so not extremely common. How do these antipsychotics work? So unlike other medicines that might block uh, serotonin reuptake or norepinephrine reuptake, 
these medicines block dopamine receptors. So it creates a little blockade and that starts to block that dopamine from reaching certain areas of the brain. So these medicines have multiple names. Uh, they might be called phenothiazines or neuroleptics. Now the neuroleptic uh, name is really a reference to their side effects because the side effects can actually be pretty dire. But before we dive into all that, um, let's try to pronounce some of them. Here we go. So there's flufenazine, which is prolixin, haloperidol or haldol, um, I do see that one prescribed quite a bit. Loxapine, which is uh, loxetane on the market. Uh, perfenazine, oh, come on, Jim, of course that's perfenazine, uh, which is trilophon. Molinodome, which is Moban. Thoridiazine, which is Marilil. And Trifluoperazine, which is Stetsaline. You might be thinking, Jim, you only pronounced like two of those right. Fine. I'm at the end of this presentation. I don't hear these words very often um, because we tend to see the second generations and that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So I told you a moment ago that the side effects of first gen antipsychotics can be pretty powerful and really quick. I just want to show you what those side effects can be. So one category is called extrapyramidal side effects, and these come in three different flavors. They can be Parkinsonian, which is going to be slowed movement, decreased facial expression, resting tremor, or shuffling gait. They can be dystonic, which is sustained muscle spasms, usually of the neck or shoulder. And by the way, when people experience this, this is extremely painful, and they're usually terrified about what's happening to them. Obviously, they don't have control over their body. And akathisia, which is intense feelings of restlessness. But the list continues. Another category of side effects are anticholinergic side effects. These are more physical, like dry mouth, eyes and nasal passages, blurred vision, intestinal slowing, also called constipation, or difficulty urinating, feeling sedated, or feeling sexually dysfunctional. Another category is anti-adrenergic side effects. So one example of this is what's called orthostatic hypotension. So this is when your blood pressure drops precipitously when you try to stand up. It can cause lightheadedness or it can cause you to fall and be injured. Obviously any medicine that's rapidly dropping your blood pressure is potentially dangerous to the patient. A fourth category of side effects are tardive dyskinesia. That can involve involuntary movement. It's when you kind of see people just bopping around or their heads kind of tumbling around um, or any other kind of involuntary musculoskeletal movement. And we tend to see this one actually when the medicine is stopped or reduced, not whenever it's being used. Last side effects I want to review with those first generation antipsychotics are just these atypical or rare ones. Again, they're not common, but it goes to show why first gens are not always the thing we want to use anymore. So a granulocytosis is a very serious blood disorder. It can kill you. Hepatitis is damage or disease of the liver. People can have seizure, seizures, not scissors, and they can also experience, get this, lactation. So they can actually have their mammary glands stimulated and it can cause them to lactate milk, men and women. So you can also experience neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Remember that I told you that FGAs are often referred to as neuroleptics, um, and this can be very dangerous. It can lead to irreversible coma or death. Now, I know at this point I've probably scared you away from the first generation antipsychotics, um, but keep in mind, they do have a purpose. They are still used, but more often we tend to see these second generation antipsychotics. So unlike the first gens, which just blockade dopamine, these ones actually blockade serotonin. That's different than SSRIs, which are reuptake inhibitors. These actually block the receptors entirely. And to some extent or another, they may also block dopamine, but they have fewer side effects and especially don't cause that involuntary movement that we've seen in others. So let's practice saying all the magic words. We have aripiprazole, abilify, acinapine, saffrous, brexipiprazole, rexalti, which by the way, um, I do see a lot of abilify, saffrous, and rexalti. Um, caraprimazine, nope, carapromazine, that's it. Nope, caraprazine, let's go with that. <laughs> Raylar, I do see that one a lot. Clonopin, which is clozaril, Iloperidone, which is Phanept, I've never seen that one used. Lorisidone, Latuda, yes, I've seen that one. Olanzapine, which is Zyprexa, yes, see that one a lot. Paliperidone in Vega. Not only do I see that, I tend to see it as an injection. Sometimes patients refuse to keep taking antipsychotics as part of their 
difficulty of dealing with psychosis and delusions. They think that they shouldn't take the medicine. And so sometimes in Vegas used as an injection to kind of buy them longer amounts of time without having to take daily pills. Catiapine, also called Seroquel, very common. Risperidone, called Risperidol, very common. And Ziprocidone, Geodon, which I haven't seen very much. So things I want you to keep in mind when you're dealing with your psychotic or delusional patients. First off, you need to keep in mind that part of their disease is extreme paranoia or fear. They have trouble believing the things around them that they're hearing, seeing, and understanding, which means they are going to have deep mistrust. This is where you as a therapist are going to be pivotal to their ability to remain medication compliant. Your therapeutic alliance is going to determine whether or not they trust these medicines and whether or not they give them a fair try. But what's also very difficult with these medicines is that it's very common that the first one they take doesn't work. So part of your education is going to have to be teaching your patients ahead of time that the medications they're going to try may not work right away and the first medicine they try may not work at all. And I usually try to tell them that we're searching for a signature blend of herbs and spices. We're trying to find just the right medicine that matches them perfectly. And you've got to be really encouraging and really motivating and telling them how proud of them you are that they can continue to give this a try so that hopefully they can find some medication relief. Because without these antipsychotics, people with psychotic or delusional disorders or those kinds of symptoms do not get better. Therapy alone is insufficient. They need the medicine. So make sure that you understand the medicines. You can pronounce the medicines. You have an understanding of what those experiences are like and you know how to encourage encourage them and prepare them that these things are not going to work right away. Thank you for putting up with me during this presentation and learning with me about the very common medicines that we will see in our work as psychotherapists. If you have any questions, feel free to comment or reach out to me. And by the way, a great book to pick up on this subject is the Handbook of Clinical Psychopharmacology for Therapists. Um, the ninth edition is out now, it was published in 2021. Great book just to have in your Kindle or in your, uh, your bookshelf to refer back to. Everything we talked about in this presentation is in those uh, that particular book and, uh, and much, much more, as well as lots of handouts that you can refer back to at a glance or pass around your clinic among your colleagues. Thanks again for learning with me today. I hope this information was uh, great and useful to you. And remember, being a competent therapist means knowing about the complementing disciplines that support our joint patients. Together, we're going to help these folks. Thanks again and have a great day.